Thank you. Um, so hi, um, and good evening or good afternoon. Um, I, I, I'm going to talk about uh, developing a continuous eBPF profiler um, and what went into the entire effort. Um, so here's the agenda. I'm going to talk about how we can take um, high resolution profiles and what I mean by that, how we make it work across user space and um, kernel space and um, different architectures and uh, for different languages, runtimes and um, across the entire, um, across bare metal systems and um, um, service in the cloud and uh, what we have planned. Um, and it's, it's uh, there's actually quite a lot of things that I want to cover here uh, because we truly do um, work um, across uh, the entire stack. There are some things uh, uh, we need to re read registers for some things and uh, then we want to uh, present the profiles in a very um, debugging friendly way and a very developer friendly way um, so that you can just take a look at um, the UI and uh, uh, find what you're debugging and um, down to the uh, line number. So uh, there's quite a lot to cover. And uh, when I actually uh, prepared the talk, uh, I rehearsed in the daytime. Uh, I think I'll be slower in the, uh, right now, it's 3.30 uh, in the morning for me. <laughs> so, but I'll still try to zip through, just bear with me. Um, anyway, since this is plumbers, before I move ahead, there's um, story time first. Um, so it's a story of how I went from the pipeline of uh, becoming uh, a profiler maintainer from a newbie kernel contributor a few years um, ago. Uh, by few years, I mean uh, just mid 2020s. Um, I was uh, I was very new to this, and um, I ended up uh, very luckily doing uh, an internship uh, working with Julia Loal uh, on Coxinel, and um, and then subsequently uh, outreach you with uh, the graphics uh, subsystem, where I worked on uh, some VKMS uh, drivers, uh, mentored by uh, Daniel Better and Melissa Wen. Um, so now coxinal patches, they involve um, finding uh, these um, patterns, sort of less optimal patterns or uh, patterns uh, susceptible to bugs maybe, and they're replaced with uh, better uh, code uh, patches. Uh, and it, coxinal is a static analyzer that does this. And when I was doing this, uh, I came across a lot of uh, such patches in the kernel, and I, it was very easy to do these things with Coxinel, but I could never understand what exactly was the impact that was happening kernel-wide and uh, how this was making a difference. Um, then uh, in the next internship, it was the graphics subsystem. Uh, I was working for these uh, something called the VKMS driver. Uh, it's um, a virtual kernel mode setting driver. What it tries to do is um, emulate your normal graphics driver, but it it does so with the intent of being able to uh, eventually run in like a headless or CI uh, sort of environment. And um, this again involved uh, learning a lot about um, you know shell basic shell C Kimu uh, like like I said I was very new to that this and uh, and also like everything about how the graphics driver worked and again I found it very very intimidating and. Uh, I didn't really understand data structures. I didn't, uh, what was most overwhelming to me was um, how uh, functions call each other, which functions calling which one, um, where is the memory leak happening? Uh, how am I supposed to like navigate the whole system? You know, you have your uh, DMSH logs, you have uh, your tracing systems, 
and um, you can take snapshots also. But how do you do link all of this together? Um, and the entire debugging process was uh, sort of looked somewhat uh, like this for me. Uh, the only tools I knew then were F-Trace. Um, it gives you uh, dynamic uh, tracing, uh, but it's it's a lot to keep up with, especially uh, you can't do this without uh, using grep also. Um, then uh, there's you have logging in real time. And uh, I, I didn't actually know about flame graphs then. I learned about it much later, but they're also like a pretty cool tool. Um, however, I always wished I could get some of these in like a single application um, and something very uh, developer friendly I guess, or very debugging friendly for somebody who's new to the ecosystem. Um, and I, I couldn't find anything back then. And next thing I know, I was also like looking for a job and everything. So. Um, so yeah, then uh, fast forward a few months, I came across continuous profiling. So this is basically what my uh, day job is. Uh, I found that um, I went to an interview and the person was like, you know, we're trying to build a system uh, that uh, can tell you uh, in sort of in real time, uh, what's going on. It can tell you which functions calling which one. It can show you an infra-wide overview. And uh, and uh, then I ended up at Polar Signals, uh, building the continuous profiler. Uh, the profiler I'm talking about is Parka. Um, and what you see on the right is actually supposed to be inverted stack traces here and we'll get into de more detail on that. I've been uh, working as a junior software engineer here and uh, been working on this for like two years and I'm very excited to tell you about all the things I've been working on. So, um, so what's Sparka? Um, we just saw flame graphs in the previous slide. Um, I want to introduce you to what uh, I call, or what we call, icicle graphs. They're called icicles because um, uh, they really look like that. Uh, but when we named them, uh, we didn't really uh, realize that they would be, uh, they're sort of like also the opposite of, uh, or inverted flame graphs. and. Uh, I think the flame and the ice thing, or the fire and the ice thing really um, goes very well with that. So now we're at the first thing on my agenda, which is um, high resolution profiling. But before we get there again, uh, I want to I want to just look at this. Uh, what this does is it uh, shows you uh, like I said, an inverted stack trace uh, or the stack trace. You can, in this one particularly, you can see the uh, the route and then you can see a Go program. You can also see the Go runtime and we'll get into more of this later. And uh, the next thing is, um, this is um, an architecture uh, diagram for Paka and uh, Parka has two components. One of them is the server. One of them is the Parka agent. And the Parka agent is the part that uh, where we use eBPF uh, to uh, get all this uh, information that we ultimately convert into stack traces. And we'll come back to this diagram later. As, as I continue uh, showing you all the parts of Parka, we'll keep referring to this. Now, uh, about high resolution dynamic continuous profiling. So what do I really mean when I say high resolution? Um, when I say high resolution, uh, I, I mean just uh, the amount of details 
we can uh, see in a, a stack trace or um, so if if you notice carefully uh, you can see uh, you can of course see the stack trace um, the the graph that you see it's um, all the lines represent a different binary and you see it over um, a certain period of time and uh, this one's configured for, I think, the last 15 minutes. And this keeps updating frequently. So uh, when I took the screenshot, it was uh, I was just uh, looking at the last 15 minutes. So um, this is a sampling profiler, uh, which means that uh, we are not really tracing this. Uh, it's taking samples like um, 19 uh, times per minute. So at like a 19, 19, uh, 19 hertz frequency. And then it uh, sends the, uh, this information every few seconds to a server where we uh, symbolize the stack traces and we can see them. Um, it, and because it does this so often, we call it a continuous profiler, it changes. It's not a static uh, a snapshot of a profile like uh, we usually get with flame graphs. Uh, or um, which is why it's um, dynamic as well. And um, the high resolution part, uh, that's something I want to talk about a bit more. So if you notice this um, box, um, I'm not sure if it's fully readable. I'm hoping it is, uh, but uh, what I, if you'll notice, um, there are, there's a lot of information you see when you hover on these uh, hover on different parts of these graphs. It's a screenshot of when I was doing that, um, and here it's um, this screenshot. Uh, it's landed up on a part where we are profiling uh, an Erlang app. So you can see the um, you can see Beam here, I think, um, and uh, you can see the uh, the process ID number. Um, you can see this is running in a container, so you can uh, uh, see the um, pod name. You can see the um, the uh, process ID host names. You can see uh, uh, the C group. Uh, you can see the name of the binary um, and uh, more useful information. Then there is um, if we go to the Next slide, um, you can see uh, this is when you click on a certain point in the icicle graph. Um, like I said, we try to uh, give profiling information down to the line number. So um, these frames that you see, um, they actually are um, indicating how much of CPU is being consumed by them. And if you and these are actually functions, each frame represents a function. Um, and so when you click on something, you can uh, see the file file it's coming from. You can see the line number here. You can see the memory address. Um, you can see whether it's like inline or not. You can see the name of the uh, binary. You can also see the build ID. Um, now something else uh, that is important here is. Um, how does this help us? You know, uh, what do you want from a continuous profiler? Like, uh, where do you draw the line between information that's helpful? Where do you draw the line between uh, information that's actually noisy? The good thing about uh, Parka is that we we have tried to uh, have an interface that uh, helps filter these things. So you can um, in the query. Uh, uh, query uh, box that you see here, you can actually specify uh, something, all of these labels. Uh, this was uh, very clearly inspired by Prometheus because um, the writer of this um, is uh, one of the major uh, contributors to Prometheus as well. And um, right now we only have CPU profiling, but um, then you can group by function names, you can um, sort. Uh, there's there's a legend that I'll, I'll be show, showing you later. It um, 
it usually has, um, it can highlight certain parts. You can search for a function. Um, and then there are other ways to see this so that you can actually cut down on the noise and only see the parts that you care about. You can also search for like a certain binary, uh, just a certain process and by just using that information. Um, and you can also like uh, search by, I think, uh, compiler versions in some cases. Uh, this is one, uh, like we saw icicle graphs. Another way of seeing this information is, um, you know, uh, there's a table form and you can see like what's the cumulative amount of CPU usage by um, every function. And uh, we call this the table view. The next thing uh, I want to show you is, um, so I think this is, um, yeah, so this is all the um, things, some of the things that you can uh, filter uh, using the query box. And uh, yeah, you can see compiler versions, I think. And um, so yeah, that's for an overview. Uh, the part that I'm mostly going to focus on next is um, what does it take to actually um, make this work from kernel space to user space and get a very infrastructure wide and that in a way that you're uh, able to like uh, just profile everything on your machine, uh, every process that runs, every binary that runs. So, um, how do we do with this? Do this. Um, a bit about profilers for the cloud native environment. I say cloud native, but actually this is something that's um, that can be run on bare metal and uh, uh, any other environment that uh, has Linux, um, as much as it can be run in cloud native. Um, so first we have uh, we start with the discovery mechanism. Um, then we have uh, a mechanism to collect these track traces. And um, by discovery mechanism, um, I mean, uh, for targets, I mean, our targets here, we uh, are actually looking at the processes mostly and the binaries. Um, and uh, here we want to target all processes. Um, and that's what we want to do with Park Aging. We were very intentional about it. Um, once we know what we want to profile, and in this case, we want to profile everything, I think, um, we have to think of how do we collect information about these so that we can um, have stack, stack traces. Um, so we collect stack traces um, across um, kernel, across user space, so everything that's running beneath the kernel, everything that's running in user space as well. Um, so we also have like not just like a wide uh, infra wide view. We also have like an infra depth view. If that makes sense. Um, the next thing is um, we need to we need to have an idea of what we want to save, how we want to save all this information, how we want to store all of this information. Um, so we we do have a specific profile format. We try to uh, compress profiles and then send them uh, to the server. One of those profile formats is eProf. Um, we use like a slightly custom format, uh, which is uh, which which is basically just uh, metadata containing like uh, locations, functions, the address mappings, um, but not really the function names. Uh, we symbolize these addresses on the server. We, we collect all of this uh, stack trace metadata into a profile format um, so that it's easy to send it over a server. And then on server side, we do the symbolization and the visualize, visualization. And uh, that's how you end up with the icicle graphs that I just showed. Um, now, uh, Today, we are mostly going to be focusing on the collection part uh, because that's the part where we majorly use eBPF. Uh, so as you can see, um, that's why there's a B there. Uh, and 
a bit about what goes on in user space and what's in kernel space. Uh, it's only the ABPF part that runs in, we run in kernel space only through the ABPF bit. Um, the rest of it, the discovery uh, of the processes, um, knowing how to, uh, where to get the information for the stack traces from, um, and then um, putting all of that into a profile format, sending it um, to the server, all of that takes place in user space. Uh, which is why one of the reasons why we're able to do this at um, such a low overhead uh, for running the agent, the overhead is actually like less than some 1% um, or at max, we have seen sometimes for very, very heavy workloads, we have seen four or 5%, but um, compared to how much uh, continuous profiling usually saves you uh, while debugging and being able to optimize um, the infrastructure and different parts of the infrastructure, it's not, it, it's, uh, it, it, you gain a lot more than you're losing. Um, uh, again, we're returning to this diagram just to make sure that everything I've said um, fits into this um, and makes it slightly clearer. We are, the rest of the talk is mostly going to be about Parker agent. Um, and so uh, let's first talk about what we do in user space. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we only do the um, eBPF bits in the kernel space, and uh, which is uh, reading sort of the stack uh, or walking the stack. Um, but the discovery mechanism for targets, it's in user space. So how do we discover targets? We discover, um, we look into the, um, look for the uh, PIDs, uh, we do process-wide um, discovery. We also look at um, everything that is um, in a Kubernetes or in a cloud native environment. So we look for containers, we look for uh, pods that might be running and we attach that metadata as well. Um, so there's um, also um, a lot of um, binaries, production binaries especially come with debug information. Uh, we care about the debug information as well. Uh, this is basically what we use to um, get information uh, there there are some uh, places that uh, strip away debug information or that uh, have debug information that's separate from the binaries so there's uh, we also have something that uh, can take care of that because symbolization usually happens on server side so um, so there, there's some amount, but still there's some amount of debug infos that we extract in the agent itself, uh, which brings us to extracting and winding information. So um, binaries um, usually are ELF binaries. Um, that's what uh, most popular executables are. Um, and dwarf is, uh, Dwarf is the specification in, or the standard in which debug information is encoded into the binary. Um, usually the way we would um, walk a stack is using frame pointers, but um, a lot of compilers, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, production uh, binaries, what they do is they strip away the frame pointers to save, I think, um, to maybe save a few bytes, or it's just built in into a lot of compilers. This basically causes um, a lot of pain for us because um, with frame pointers, it's very easy. Uh, with um, Without frame pointers, uh, there are additional complications, sort of, uh, because uh, but we thankfully have the dwarf format to save us. Um, there are several tools, uh, inbuilt tools in the Linux kernel usually to read ELF and dwarf uh, information. You may be familiar with some of them. Read ELF, uh, object dump, uh, 
but um, the dwarf information is typically also encoded in the binary. So it's encoded in the each frame section of the binaries. Um, each frame uh, stands for for, I think, exception handling frame. And that's also what uh, gives you the um, exception handling, the, the stack trace that you get if a C++ program uh, panics. Uh, so let's, um, what we do in Parfait Agent is we build an unwind table from uh, the information that we, from the dwarf information that we get in this EH frame section. Um, here's an overview of what the unwind table looks like. Um, so we have like a location. Uh, we, we take the program counters and we have uh, a location, memory location associated with all of these, with the program counters. Then uh, there are certain rules in the dwarf specification um that uh that tell us um the offset of of um the stack pointer register and the uh, frame pointer registers um then we also have an extra uh, register or some an extra value that we need which is the return address um if if you think about it a uh, stack uh, stack trace is essentially sort of a collection of uh, written addresses of uh, the functions that are being called. And um, we need to calculate the return address in uh, both x86 and ARM64, but um, the ARM64 dwarf specification um, and the uh, hardware architecture actually has a separate register where it uh, stores the return addresses. Um, we so we use that for ARM64. It's kind of optional. We don't really need it uh, in x86. Uh, some more about it. So uh, we, in user space, in agent user space, we extract uh, each frame information. Uh, we use that to get the unwind table rows. And then we further um, put, put it into a format of compact unwind table rows. Um, the compact on mind table rows just takes like the uh, the program counter, um, a link register offset, uh, which the link register offset is set to zero uh, for ARM64. Uh, we don't really care about it uh, in x86. Sorry, uh, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, it's set to zero for x86. We don't really care about it. Um, we care about the program counter. We um, care about uh, whether um, the dwarf information is uh, calculating an offset from um, the stack pointer or, or the frame pointer. And um, so that's why we have the CA fit type that's essentially giving us uh, information about the stack pointer. Um, then we have the RBP type, which is telling us about the frame pointer, and we have the offsets for both of these, which help us uh, calculate uh, the memory addresses uh, for for these uh, values. Um, then, um, so this is what um, actually the unwind tables look like, or uh, this is um, one of the snippets for uh, libc. Uh, it's on x86. Um, if you uh, you'll notice uh, the RBP types zero in which uh, what this probably means is that this is like a stripped binary. So we don't really have frame pointers. Um, and the CFA type is to, this means uh, we're using just stack pointers and uh, we can use the CFA offset to calculate the stack pointer. And then we use uh, this information along with uh, the instruction pointer information that we uh, get. Um, to calculate the frame pointer and unwind. Um, and, time time um, track. Somewhere um, you have about four minutes left. Oh, well, okay. I'm, I'm very, so, okay, I'll zip through. Um, so 
there is a, this is also like next we have the um, architecture, the unwind table for uh, X, sorry, ARM64. Uh, you can see that there is um, the LR offset uh, uh, there for um, ARC64, which is extra. And now, okay, what do we do in kernel space? Um, in kernel space, um, the way Parka agent works is it profiles, um, it uses, um, it attaches a BPF hook, um, attaches a perf event hook using BPF, and uh, we sample every 19 um, times a minute, and we we put this information into the BPF maps, and we sort of uh, put it into a uh, we update this in user space every 10 seconds, and then we send it to the server also like every 10 seconds, which is why it's a sampling profiler. It's not like continuous. Um, and uh, okay, this is how we uh, basically send them from uh, user uh, kernel space, uh, sorry, from user space to kernel space. Uh, we use a very simple buffer um, to only send uh, the unwind table row information. Uh, that's updated in uh, BPF on the BPF side, and then walking the stacks. So, um, okay, walking the stacks. Usually, what it means is that we are trying to keep track of the. We're reading the registers and trying to figure out the return addresses for each function, and. Uh, this looks slightly different for x86 and um, ARM64. Um, I've linked the code, but there are other things. So I'll, I'll again just leave the slides, skip over a bit. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, compilers and runtime. So we support a lot of compiled languages. We recently added support for just in time uh, jitter stacks also. Um, so Node.js, Julia, uh, we very recently added support for Python and Ruby stacks. Um, you can see a Python uh, stack trace. I think this is Fibonacci. Um, same thing for Ruby. Um, and there is, uh, this is for jittered runtimes. Um, we had to write like a toy interpreter because we were not sure what jitter stacks actually look like. Even GDB doesn't do this fully correctly, so we were very unsure here. So my colleague wrote a toy uh, binary that actually emits JIT code. Um, you can see ahead of time and JIT sections here. And then uh, I never thought uh, if you, I would be able to look at VS Code stacks, but there it is. The thing is, this is not fully correct. This is like a very old uh, image when we were still, I was still developing uh, JIT um, unwinding. And uh, so it, it turns out that um, there are some gotchas here and uh, which, which mean extremely cool things that we uh, learned. Um, so the VS code uh, uses like um, V8 engine underneath, uh, which is also like uh, used uh, in in a lot of JavaScript uh, ecosystems. Uh, we, it's also used in Electron apps, which was VS code. We discovered something that V8 um, engine emits its own uh, assembly code, which is why our usual jitter unwinding wasn't working. Uh, there was a fix for it. Uh, which is, and there's a blog post linked in the correctly profiling uh, Node.js part. Um, Sumaya, then, I, uh, you, Sumaya um, your time has run out. Do you want to wrap it up in like 30 seconds? Yeah, cool. Okay. So um, I'm really at the end of it, actually. So something I wanted to talk about is that we also run, um, we, a large part of our end users are people who are, uh, run uh, production systems in the cloud. So um, these are uh, the major uh, providers they used to run. Um, we try to support versions 5.3 plus, um, but we always we recommend version 6.3 plus because there are some very bad kernels um, or kernel bugs uh, in in the 5.19 to 5.6 to the 6.1 versions. 
And uh, Alexei was uh, has actually sent a fix long back, and it's backported. But um, most distros don't update. Uh, custom kernels don't backport fixes. Um, even if upstream goes very fast, um, it's this is not something that's reflected in most of the uh, platforms that end users use. Um, so um, update your machines, I guess. Um, to whoever's watching this, um, and uh, uh, that's all. I think there are a lot of things we want to have in the future roadmap, uh, language support. Um, we have a lot more languages coming up, um, and then we want to improve all the code coverage. Sorry, Your time has really well now. I don't want to run run off too much at night. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Sumia. Yeah, thank you. And I'm so sorry. Um, if you have any questions, do drop them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer all of them. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you. How do I? How, how do I quit, um, like, untake uh, control of this?